Hi, it's Rich from Low and Design. Today we're going to make a crazy clock. The clock has a bunch of really cool ways to tell time. And they range from very, very simple ones where the time just switches to ones where it, it chugs around and the next number is displayed to some that are far more complex where the numbers uh, all go to zero and then go to their number or show all bananas. Uh, one, it goes all zeros and then goes all ones, twos, threes. It was a lot of fun to come up with different ways to make the thing accessible and make it interesting. We wanted it so that somebody coming in and looking at this would be intrigued and then would realize that it is rendering the time in different ways and try to figure out what those ways are. Well, what did it do that time? Why did it do that? What's that about? And uh, it really, it is transfixing for people. Like when it's running in the back of a room, Everybody's always glancing over at it just to see what it's up to. It uses a zero sensor at the top. And so when you turn it on, the first thing it does is loop around and find the zero for each of the four digits. And then it knows how to display the time. And some little things are in there, like uh, when it displays a zero, it automatically re-centers itself. So it lines itself back up with the zero, which, you know, uh, protects it from possibly bugs in the software, which is incredibly unlikely. Why isn't it working? Funny that it thinks it's 1137. That didn't work. That didn't work. Uh, to just, you know, something interfering with the motion and it'll reset itself as, as the clock goes. It's the same idea as we have a the GPS setting, a real-time clock setting, a software clock. So the, if it's in a room where there is no GPS uh, signal available, it'll run with the real-time clock and start up and it'll have the right time. But when it does detect a GPS signal, it'll synchronize itself to, to the exact second. And so, I mean, I can watch with, with my, you know, a very, very accurate uh, watch or clock and you'll see that the time is, you know, it changes time and is deadly, deadly accurate. By my watch here, five, four, three, two, one, off it goes. It was a lot of fun to come up with different ways of rendering the time and to figure out how to efficiently do that in software. So the way you know, it goes and calls a rendering routine 10 times a second. So 600 times over one minute, you can have steps in the rendering, but you want to also, for each step, you want it to complete that step before you do the next. So sometimes this one will be just ticking from eight to nine, just moving in 60 steps. And uh, the code just calls a move, waits until that move is done, waits until it's the next time, and then does the next move. When I first made this, I had the numbers closer together, and I used that for development on the, the test bench, and it was cool, but the whole thing would have been about this big. I wanted a big chain. I wanted something that was substantial, like you, recognizable like a bicycle chain, but big and kind of industrial looking and kind of fun. And I really love the way the numbers shake around. Uh, I've used bolts with a nylon uh, locking nut so that I can leave the numbers a little bit loose. And as the whole thing goes, as numbers move and stop, the whole chain will shake around, and, and it's a nice, nice effect. It's, it's more human, more real. The digits are uh, polycarbonate or Lexan, and we started with just normal uh, acrylic plastic.
And what we found was that it was just a little bit brittle. And so the numbers, when they go around the top, there's quite a lot of acceleration. They, it looks like they're going pretty slowly, and then they go zoom around the top. And we would come in, we'd leave it going overnight, testing itself, come in in the morning, and there would be numbers on the floor. Like uh, it had flung its numbers off. So we went with uh, Lexan, and then we had to get them cut on a uh, water jet cutter, because cutting uh, this kind of plastic, Lexan, on a laser cutter releases a, a chlorine gas, and we didn't want to take a chance with that. So we found that uh, a university in town that would, that would cut them for us. And uh, so that worked out great. My initial plan was that the numbers would be uh, clear. That, and then the light at the top would shine down and illuminate them uh, like an edge-lit plastic thing. But while we were building it and, and sort of putting wood in place behind it, I noticed that we had some of the digits that were clear, but others uh, that I had left the white plastic on. And they were so much more visible and, and interesting and, and all that. So I uh, said, no, oh, no, well, we'll just go and paint them all in behind. And that let us put yellow behind the bananas. And uh, then the white numbers on the black background work great in daylight and at nighttime and whatnot. One thing we've got is a motion detector down here. So the clock can detect when there's somebody in the room or nearby within like 30 or 40 feet or 10 meters. And uh, so when it doesn't detect anybody there, after half an hour, it shuts down and just goes into a, the most sedate way of telling the time, which is just rolling in the next time. So all the chains, everything stays pretty still. And then after a couple of hours of that, it just shuts itself down completely until somebody walks in front of it and then it all goes crazy and starts telling the time again. So we did that just so that if it was in a room by itself, there's no point in displaying the time unless somebody is there to experience it. It's hard on all the gears and we're gonna wear out parts and all that. Here's the back of the clock. You can see there's four Technique's stepper motors. Each stepper motor also has a zero sensor along with it. And we have two electronics boxes, one with the high power electronics and that's the big power supply that drives the motors and whatnot. And then this other box is just more the computing box, the electronics. We started out with an Arduino, and we switched to using a Teensy 4.1. And it's got a GPS, it's got a real-time clock, and it's got a potentiometer on the side, and it's got a relay down here that connects to the motion detector. The potentiometer is used to set how crazy you want the clock to be. So you can turn the knob down to zero, and which it just tells time in the most sedate, calm way possible. And then turning it up, it gets more and more crazy until it starts using all the crazier uh, time rendering methods. Sitting here with a clock, standing here with a mess of wires and electronics all mounted on a board that we just have to stick on the back of the clock. 
How hard can that be? That's the electronics. Now let's look at the software and see how that works. In an Arduino, there's a uh, startup code, and that's a little block of code that runs and sets up inputs and outputs. <laughs> See, I used to be, uh, used to run a software company, and when I would go on the whiteboard and tell the programmers what to do, this is the kind of stuff I wrote. And then they'd come back to me later and say, I have no idea what you were talking about, and my notes and pictures that I took are meaningless. And so that encouraged people to ask questions during the meeting. And uh, so that's basically how the code is going, calling a renderer a whole bunch. Uh, there's other routines in there to handle the, uh, the real-time clock code, the GPS. That's about it for the software. One of the neat things about this clock is that it used a whole bunch of the tools in our shop, from the CNC router, table saw, to a mill, lathe, plasma cutter, and we outsourced some stuff to a uh, CNC water jet cutter down to the oscilloscopes and soldering irons and electronics components and all that. So it, it was one of those projects that used just about every machine we have in the shop. It, it was a long project. I was thinking about it over the last few years and, uh, and then started working on it about six months ago. And now we're done. And uh, it's just a really, really neat thing to have around. Thanks a lot. I'm Rich from Lowen Design. Make sure you don't show my bald spot. Hardy, hardy, hard. Our clock is very tall. I live in fear of it catching my hair. It hasn't happened yet. But you know, it might. Our clock has color cycling LED lighting. Good for sexy time. It's the sort of clock you can peek around behind. Now, continue to look impressive. We should start every video with me looking impressive. We have a separate box for the high power stuff, which is this, so all we have to do is fit this in here. It's easy. And uh, then we'll call her done. See? Neat. Not really.
Was I at two or three? It was probably two. No, I think it's three. It has to be a better way. <laughs>